Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and inspire your future. For more information about our church, please visit us at ourjourney.church. Now, here is Pastor Vince Farrell. Have you ever been misunderstood or maybe misrepresented? Have you ever had someone think they know who you are only to finally meet you and say, oh, you're not at all like I thought you were? We've all at different times been labeled. We've all had things assumed about us that aren't true. And the truth is, we do this with God too. Millions of us go through life and we think we know all about God. We've heard of Jesus. We've heard of the Ten Commandments. We know most of the rules. But do we know who He truly is? Do we know what he's really like. This Easter, can we give a round of applause to all those watching online? We're so glad you're here. I want to call this message, What God Wants You to Know. And the reason why is because not only is today Easter, but how many of you noticed Easter fell on April 1st? And what is April 1st? How many of you have been tricked already? Uh, One of you, yeah. Um, I was making sure my wife didn't get the rubber band around the spray nozzle. That seems to be my son's favorite. Um, But the day is not over. I know some of you have got plans. Um, I think it's appropriate that Easter falls on April Fool's this year because Jesus fooled everyone. You know, the, 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 the religious leaders were looking for a Messiah that would deliver them from the government that was happening, the situation that was going on. People were looking for a Messiah that was going to deliver them from this natural situation. And Jesus had different plans. God had different plans. And we see that God sent his son Jesus for a specific reason, and we're going to look at that this morning. Now, How many of you can quote John 3.16? How many of you would be honest enough to say, no, I can't? Several of us, yeah. John 3.16 is one of those verses that somewhere around 10 years ago, most people, I would say 90% of people could quote. That was kind of the church's mantra. How many of you remember watching a football game or, or something on TV and seeing someone hold up a sign, John 3, 16? And unfortunately, the church has kind of changed its mantra to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Don't judge me. How many of you noticed that? And so I want us to get back to the original verse of what we as a church should hold dear to our hearts. This morning, if you know how to quote it, will you quote it with me? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that his only begotten son, that Okay, yeah, look at it on screen real quick. For those of us who you'd be honest to say, yeah, I don't, I don't know that. This is a powerful verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only. That's, that's a key, key word right there. Because there's some other religions out there that think God has children on every planet. And, uh, it, no. Only son. That whosoever. That's another powerful word. What does whosoever mean? Whosoever. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean just the really good people? Nope. Wait a minute. You mean even the really terrible people? Yes, even you. (laughs) Whosoever. Even me. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish. That, That word perish means to die. 
We all know we're going to die physically, but there's something tucked in that word that's extremely exciting. But have everlasting life. Now, many of us here this morning said, yes, we can quote John 3.16. Can I push on a little further and ask you how many of you can quote the next verse, which is John 3.17? A couple of us. Awesome. That's awesome. I cannot. So I've got it on screen for us. And this is just as important as John 3.16. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. I I italicize the word condemn because I want to focus just for a few moments this morning on this word condemn. And I want to share with us this morning something that I really believe God wants you to know. And if this is your very first time here, God wants you to know this. If you've been here for the last two months and you've heard our series talking about Dear Church, over the last two months we've we put our ear to the chest of God to hear what God wants to tell us. And in like manner, this morning, as I share with you what God wants you to know, you could, you could rephrase that by saying, Dear Vince, and put your name in that spot. Here's what God's heartbeat is for you. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, on the back of your bulletin or your smartphone or tablet, whatever you want to take notes on is awesome. You can even take your camera and hold it up to the screen and take photos. You're totally welcome to do that, okay? Okay? There we go. All right. I like a little interaction. I forgot my hearing aids, so y'all speak up. God is not mad at you. Now, now let that soak in just for a second. Because if you've been coming to church for any length of time, you're like, okay, next slide. (laughs) No, I was just saying that, John. Thank you. (laughs) Y'all give it up for our sound and video personnel. They just do an awesome job. If if you've been to church, then then you may think, well, yeah, I know that. What's the next point, Pastor Vince? But the truth of the matter is, many of us don't really understand that. So I want to unpack this statement because it's easy to get religious when we hear this phrase, God is not mad at you. But if we looked at our lifestyle, if we looked at how we operate every day, then we would say we don't truly believe that. Our lifestyle may reflect something different. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to give you five points, and I'll have them numbered one through five. But in between those five points, I want to give you some just general statements. Here's a general statement I want us to understand. People who believe deep down that God is mad at them will spend little time thinking or talking about God. People that really believe God is mad at them will spend little time in their life thinking about God, talking about God. And the reason why is because I think God's mad at them. Why would you want to think about or talk about someone who you think's mad at you? See, unbelievers or, or lost people, all my friends are heathens. Take it slow. <laughs> None of them naturally on their own think about God. People have to be invited to think about God. You know how I know this? Because if you are here this morning and you've ever asked one of your friends or family members that you love to either come to church with you or you ask them the big question, you know what the big question is? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Then their rebuttal to you is short. Oh, I don't want to go to church. Man, quit talking to me about God. The reason why they're angry when you bring up the subject of God is because you have forced them to enter into thinking about something that they rather not think about. Why would people want to gloss over the issue over something so important? 
If we were to take a survey this morning and ask, how's your retirement plan? How's your retirement savings going? How's your 401k going? Do you have a plan or a strategy in place? Statistically, in America, 85% of us have no retirement plan. How much more an eternity plan? See, eternity is not something people think about all the time. Especially if we believe God is mad at us. And it's only until someone outside our own mind asks the question, how are you doing spiritually? Hey, you want to go to church with me? Or maybe that little bumper sticker (laughs) that causes us to relapse into reality. And we're faced with the thought, where am I at? If you, um, if you, if you're like me and you ask people about church or how they're doing, one of the things I have shifted my conversations when talking to people is I've quit asking them to come to church. I've simply asked them the question, hey, what do you love most about Jesus? And then that opens up a whole slew of, of emotions and conversations. And one of the things I've heard is, you know, I will, I will start coming to church and I'll, 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 when I get my life ready. I'll start coming and, and being a good person when, when I get my life back on track. And the truth of the matter is, that's a false statement. We don't spend our days naturally thinking about eternity and God, and it's often because of this scripture verse proves it right here. Romans chapter 3.10, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is not anyone who understands. There is none who seeks after God. The way we start to seek after God is through an invitation. Someone asks you, you want to join me at church? Someone asks you, hey, how are you doing spiritually? Someone asks you, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? And we need individuals to ask us this because it's the process that God opens the door by someone knocking, by someone inviting, by someone asking. It brings us to this thought Are we really right with God? And most of the times when we're faced with that question, we kind of detour back to the concept of, I think God is mad at me. I I think if I was to be honest with you, Pastor Vince, if you knew my situation, if you knew what I had done, if you knew what I've been, what I've been engaging in, then you would know completely and wholeheartedly that God is mad at me. And because of this lifestyle of a feeling that God is mad at them, it then leads to the second pushback, which is, well, you want to come to church with me? And and if you've asked your friends and family, like I've asked my friends and family, the common pushback is, oh, I don't go to church because church is full of... Yeah, you've met my friends and family. (laughs) Or maybe they come to church and the pushback is all they hear is you're going to go to hell Fire and brimstone if you don't get your life right. Wow. One of the the things I love about Journey Church, and if you're here this morning, we invite you to journey with us. We're not perfect. In fact, we're just everyday people trying to live for God. Our, our, Our motto is simple. Come as you are and leave a little bit more like Jesus. And one of the compliments I hear over and over again is from our children to our adults is, wow, this church is fun. Now for me, I've always grown up in a fun church. 
And so for me, it's just natural. Well, church should be fun. We have the resurrection, Holy Spirit, Jesus in us. But I have also traveled the globe. And I have also spoke at a lot of churches. And wow, our church is fun. <laughs> I hear things like, you know, I, I feel God's presence here. I, I, I just feel something here. Now, like I said before, at the core of reasoning of, of why people don't want to come to church, why people don't want to think about eternity is because they wrestle with this mindset that God is mad at them. And those outside the church assume, sometimes correctly, that the only condemnation awaits them inside the church. The, the pushback of not going to church to, to experience God's presence, to, to hear a message that will hopefully change your life, is because people think church is filled with nothing but condemnation. And why would I want to go someplace to get beat up? Why do I want to go to a, a, a church that says, For God so loved the world, but they forgot verse 17. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. If we as a church would look at John 3, 16, and 17 as our mantra, our life, then what it does is it says this, that we as a church, say that with me, we as a church should be focused on loving God and loving others. That's our, that's our mantra right there. To love God and love others. Which begs the question. And we're going to answer some of these questions. But I want you to turn with me at Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 and 11. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him. And his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Listen, if you're here this morning and you work for the IRS, I'm sorry, that's just what. <laughs> See, Jesus had no problem sitting down with sinners. Jesus had no problem. It was the religious people that had the problem. It was the, 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 Jesus didn't approve of their lifestyle, but watch this. He did not condemn them. He just simply provided a door to reach them. Are you here this morning? Let me give you another point. There will always be a group of people who claim to represent God, but they do not represent God properly. Let me, let me just say, if you're here this morning and you've been to churches and you felt condemned and you felt beat up, while I can't apologize for those churches, what I can say is that here at Journey Church, our goal is not to come condemning, but allow the Holy Spirit to convict there to be life transformation because God is not mad at you. Now that was good preaching. I deserve a better amen than that. God is not mad at you. Jesus did not come to condemn. In fact, do you know why Christ didn't condemn people? I want you to think about that for a moment. John 3.17 says that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world. Okay? So, so why Christ being holy, being perfect, who knows everything... Why did he not come around saying to people, well, this is what you did, and this is what you did, and this is what you did, and this is what you did. He had perfect ability to condemn people, but he didn't. And why not? Why did Christ, 
There's the answer. Because we're already condemned. We're already condemned. John 3, 18. If you're in John, look at the next verse. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. See, when we as fallen man, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, from the moment you and I are born, there is sin in our life. We are condemned already. And until we come to Jesus, we die. It's, it's like prison. The only, there's many people in prison who are there because of breaking the law, things of that nature. But the only people in prison that are condemned are the ones with a death penalty. Are you following me? And that's how you and I were. We as fallen people, sinful people, were condemned to death. Now, we, the reason why we need a proper understanding of this is because we also need to understand how powerful life is. It's because we have been in a winter season this last few months. How many of you are tired of the rain? Yeah. But how many of you know what comes after the rain? What comes after the winter? Are y'all seeing it in your house so far? Man, there's little buds popping up, flowers. Yesterday, I don't know if you got to get out or, or Friday, but man, Friday was just awesome. Beautiful weather. Where we live, the trees are already starting to bloom. Why? Because there is power in life. Trees are budding, flowers are blooming. But what happens is, is we typically don't focus on those things because if you're dead inside spiritually, then all you can see is death. You know, we as humans, we're all going to die one day. And I know you're sitting here thinking, wow, I'm so glad I came to this church. But we are going to die one day. Now, I, I'm, I'm 42, and at 20 years ago, if you were to tell me those statistics of one day you're going to die, I would sit there and be like, okay, whatever. Because I'd play basketball and twist an ankle, and the next day I'm playing basketball again, no problem. Now at my age, I crack a rib and I'm done. I twist an ankle and it takes weeks because we are slowly dying. But inside, our spirit, when we've come to Christ, even though our natural body is going to die, our spiritual does not have to die at all. We'll live forever. That's why the question of how are you doing spiritually is an important question. Here's, here's a thought. If the disciples really believed that Jesus was going to come alive, then they would have been waiting for him outside the, the tomb. Jesus told them what was going to happen. Jesus explained to them what was going to happen. Where was their faith? Their faith was in the grave that it was over, that death had won. Here's point number one. Jesus came to remedy death. Jesus came to remedy death. Because of his resurrection, we don't have to die spiritually. Now think about that. Because as the church, that should be our focus, our voice as a church. The early church, this was their claim. That 
the one who started the Christian movement, okay, and they didn't call themselves Christians until later on. The one who started, the leader of the church, Jesus, they go out telling, of course they shared about the miracles and the things, but the number one focus is that he has risen. Eleven out of twelve disciples died horrible deaths. Only John lived to be old age. But every single one of them died horrendous deaths for this belief that Jesus resurrected. Y'all here? You ask me what I believe? Well, I'm going to believe what Jesus said. Because he rose from the grave. And if anyone raises from the grave, then I want to be a part of that movement. Well, Pastor Vince, do you really believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Yeah, because Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Well, that seems a little short-sighted. That doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right. You know what? When you die and raise from the dead and live again, then you get to create the rules. So I'm going to be with Jesus. Number two, condemnation comes from death. But faith in Christ is what lifts the death sentence. See, here, here's, here's what I mean by this. God is not mad at you. But I have heard my fair share of ministers and Christians that are so condemning over every little thing. And if you don't believe me, just look at Facebook. And here's the pushback. The reason why people jump on the bandwagon to condemn others is because there's still death in them, not life. Well, Pastor Vince, I'm a Christian. Doesn't mean you're alive. I've met some dead Christians before. Amen. Romans 8, chapter, uh, uh, verses 1 through 3. I want you to see this real quick. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not work, walk according to the flesh. This is a powerful verse right here. Because, like I shared last week, there's a lot of Christians that walk according to the flesh. If it feels good, I do it. If it's financially okay, then I do it. And, 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 and not in Christ Jesus. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Let me explain it to you this way. How many of you know the law of gravity? What's the law of gravity? What goes up? Okay, that's the law of gravity. In the same way, there is a law of sin and death in this world. It is like the law of gravity. Every single one of us are going to die one day. If not naturally, definitely spiritually. That's what sin has done. It has separated us from God. However, how many of you know, many years ago, a couple brothers found out another law. The Wright brothers discovered the law of lift. The law of lift. And the law of lift states if the undercurrent is thicker than the upper, then you get lift. It's not technically correct, but I think we've all been on an airplane and we believe in the law of lift. And so what happens? The law of lift supersedes the law of gravity. And that's what Christ has done. That when Christ came and died for our sins and then came back to life, for those of us who put our 
Freedom in what Christ did, not what we did, because we can't do anything, but what he did, then the law of life supersedes the law of death. Are you seeing that? Amen. Romans 8.11 says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Amen. When you have the law of life in you, when you have Jesus Christ in you, there is no condemnation. Well, yeah, but Pastor Vince, I feel bad when, when I don't do the things I should do. Good, that's called conviction. There is a difference between conviction and condemnation. Can I get an amen? amen? For those of you that don't know it, let me explain it to you. As a Christian, as someone who has given my life to Christ, who, who lives in the law of life, I still have a flesh and a soul. Are you following me? Amen. We are body, soul, and spirit, okay? My spirit is who I am, is saved. My soul, which is my mind, my will, and my emotions, is in the process of being saved. I'm not there yet. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I do things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. And there's a struggle because we're in the process of being saved. And then our body will one day be saved. It's going to go in the ground and come back to life when Jesus comes back. Check out Revelation. It's really awesome. Am saved, being saved, will one day be saved. Are you, are you with me? So as a spirit man who knows God's word and, 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 and is in the law of life, sometimes my soul acts out. Sometimes I lose my temper. Glad my staff didn't amen on that one. Thank you guys for showing me grace. Sometimes I do things that are not holy. And it's during those times that I feel God saying, son, hey, son, 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 bring it in. <laughs> Conviction. Conviction always propels us to be more like Jesus. Condemnation always prohibits us from acting like Jesus. Are you saying that? That's why those who feel condemned, they, they drop out of church. They drop out of fellowship with other believers. They want nothing to do with God because they think God's mad at them because all they feel is this, this thumb underneath them pushing them down. I got news for you. That is not God because God's not mad at you. That is the enemy trying to keep you from being more like Jesus. Number three. Good works did not win this favor with God. Amen. When we come to this life of Jesus Christ, this resurrection lifestyle that we were once dead, but we put our faith in Jesus and now we're alive, why, where did that come from? Well, first of all, we need to understand that it wasn't good works. If you're here this morning and, and you'd say, well, you know, if I, if I give money to the church and I come on Sundays faithfully, then, you know, hopefully I can, I can get to heaven. It, it doesn't work that way. It's not going to happen that way. And that's contrary to our world. Our world gives rewards based on progress. Y'all notice that, right? I mean, our jobs give us bonuses. We, we, just everything in life is things that we do. We receive things on how we perform. We receive things when we, ha I mean, let's just be honest. How many parents, if you would just quit crying, I will give you. <laughs> if you would just stay in your room, go to bed. It's like a reverse hostage situation. <laughs> you stay in there and I'll give you anything helicopter to Cuba, you know, I mean, <clears throat> just stay in bed, you know. But God's favor is not based on what I do. I guess my microphone caught off on that one. Let me <clears throat> God's favor is not based on what I do. 
His word says that he gives to the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, that's not fair. No, it's not. It's called God's grace. When, when we get into the that's not fair mindset, what we're really saying is, I want more. And God's favor is not based on our good works. Number four, God's favor is based on those who believe in him. That's how we obtain God's favor. When we believe in him. Now, I have highlighted this word believe because in our English language, we have just butchered this word. We think believing has to do with our mind if we, you know, believe on something. And we equate belief with, you know, uh, making a wish and hoping real hard. And that is not a biblical definition of belief. And so I've given you these th three words. To believe means to fully trust in God. To surrender to God. To fear Him. Now, now let me explain this real quick. Fearing God is simply this. Fearing God is letting what God's Word says affect your life. Making decisions based on what you see God values. That's what it means to fear God. When, when God says, this is how I want you to forgive, then instead of bucking up and saying, well, you don't understand God, I can't forgive them until they do this, this, and this. I didn't do that for you. I forgave you when you put your trust in me. You put your belief in me. Now I want you to forgive them. But, 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 but God. See, when we, when we live in a way that lines up with the way God lives, that's fearing Him. That we have such a respect for Him. We have such a trust in Him. That when God says something in His Word that makes us go, ooh, that's hard. I mean, I don't know if I can do that, God. Then our faith says, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. Because I trust in what God says. I, I value what he says. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 10, verses 1. I've got this on the screen that you can look at it later. We're not going to read all 48 verses. Can I get an amen? That wasn't enough, so I guess we will. Now, I just want to show you this story that is such a powerful story. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 48. I'm only going to read the first 5 or 15 or 30. I don't know. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion. Now, the reason why the Bible points that out is because he was not a Jew. Okay? He was not one of God's chosen people. Verse 2, he was a devout man, one who, watch this, feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius, verse 4, and when he observed him, he was afraid. He was afraid. What is it, Lord? Your prayers and alms have come as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. If you read on verses 6 through 48, you see that God was doing something in Peter's life as well about Cornelius, about Gentiles. There was this separation. There was this animosity between Jews and Gentiles. And God was speaking to Peter and God was speaking to Cornelius. And he says to Cornelius, hey, listen, Cornelius. Man, it's great that you're giving offerings. It's great that you're praying. But those things is not what gives you favor. I love in verse 9, if you're still there, that it says that while on their journey... Because we're called Journey Church. Okay, that was, that was a good one. While on their journey, journey for what? 
Because God told Cornelius through an angel, through a vision, I need you to go talk to Peter because what you need, Cornelius, is you need Jesus. And Peter introduces to Cornelius the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Cornelius gives his life to Jesus. That's how we get favor, by giving our life to Christ. That's what scripture said. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's why people who are not in Christ Jesus don't have resurrection life, and it's why death comes out of their mouth so many times. Here's point number five, last point. A solid life in Christ is to allow Christ in you. A solid life in Christ is to allow Christ in you. It's Easter Sunday, and I don't think we can get away from some chocolate bunnies this morning. I'm going to give you a little example here. Our ushers are going to give you something here in just a moment. But while they get ready, I'm going to ask for a couple people. I'm going to ask uh, Matt Blanchard, would you, you join me on stage? I'll give Matt Blanchard a hand if you would. <laughs> Frank, Frank, will you give me a hand too? Frank, awesome. Now, guys, I have two chocolate bunnies I've also got some gloves. I want you to stand behind them. Go ahead and put the gloves on. Because out here, one of these bunnies is hollow, and one of them is solid. And you can't tell because they look identical. I'm going to ask you guys, if you would, just put your hands around them and just hold on to them. Okay. Don't do anything around their belly there, Matt. There we go. How many of you think Matt's bunny is solid? A couple of you, yeah? Give me, a, give me a Yahoo! All right. How many of you think Matt's bunny's hollow? All right. How many of you think Frank's bunny is hollow? I don't hear your hand raising, Lyle. I got to hear it. All right. How many of you think it's solid? All right. How many of you are just guessing? Yeah. <laughs> Not a clue. Now, I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, to very softly apply pressure to those bunnies. Okay. Are you applying pressure? Give it some pressure. You're a military man. I want a close-up on his face. There is a vein. Come on, Frank. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all give him a hand. Y'all give him a hand. Thank you, guys. Frank, you get to take this bunny home later on today, okay? Uh, Matt, you get to take all these pieces home later on today. <laughs> clean, clean this carpet. No. The reason why I love this example, a solid life in Christ means you're going to have to do some things. You're not saved because of works. You don't go to church and give money and, and, and work in the children's ministry and all these things happen and then you get to go to heaven because you did some great things. No, we just saw where Cornelius needed Jesus in his life. And it's when he experienced Jesus in his life that he continues to do great and marvelous things for God. If you want a solid life, two points I want to make to you. Number one, the way you reveal if Christ is in you and you have a solid life in Christ is when pressure is applied. When pressure is applied, and many of us in this room, we know our friends, we know family members that have, that have dropped out, that have quit God, they think he's mad at them, and they've crumbled, and it's because they're hollow. Second thing is there's a value difference in these bunnies. 
Th this hollow bunny costs about ten dollars. The solid bunny, sixty-five dollars. That is a lot of chocolate. But that's how life works. And I'm not talking financially. Please hear me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about doing what God's word says. That's the, that's the dollar amount. Christians who don't read their word, who don't fear God... I mean, they gave their life to Christ, and I'm definitely not questioning their salvation because I don't know. I just know the fruits of where they're standing now, and it's pretty hollow because they don't spend time in God's Word. They don't do what the Bible calls these works. It didn't cost them anything. And so when troubles come, they crumble under pressure. And they think, and maybe you're here and you think, that God is mad at you, and He's not. He loves you. And there's no condemnation for you. Amen. But Christians who spent time on their knees, who've had to say, no, no, let's, let's turn off the television this night. Let's, instead of watching that, let's, let's not watch that. Let's, I know everyone's engaging in that, and, and it's only a little bit of cussing, and it's only a little, but, but let's, just, let's just have a standard that says, you know what, let's not allow anything immoral to be in us. Let's put God's word in us instead. And, and that's hard to do because everyone, including Christians, are like, have you watched this episode yet? No, I don't, because I don't watch that. You a holy roller? No, I'm just, I'm just trying to build a solid life in Christ. Amen. And maybe someday I will, but right now I'm just not there. James chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. I want to read this to you. James chapter 2, verse 1, talks about works. Talks about if you have faith then there should be works that follow. And again, please hear, this is not working to be like Christ, to get him in your life. That's not what this verse is talking about. I love the Message Bible in verses 19 because it just throws it out there in our modern-day English so well. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one true God? Yeah, I'm a Christian, Pastor Vince. I, I gave my life to Christ when I was nine years old. I'm a Christian. Do I hear you professing about the one true God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? I gave my life to Christ, and, and I'm good. But, but, but you're never reading God's Word. You're never practicing what the minister is preaching, diving in to... to Lay your head on God's heart because he is not mad at you. He would love nothing more than a relationship with you. Well, that's just great. <laughs> demons do that. In other words, he's saying, you believe in God? Even demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads, guys. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? See, a lot of people speak death because they've got a corpse on their hands. A lot of people speak death because they're hollow inside. And they're quick to condemn every little thing because there's no actions to extend love to those that have hurt. I said this once, I'll say it again. We as the church should be focused on loving God, loving others. Loving God is super easy because He's invisible. I mean, how do we know we're loving God? You spend time in your prayer closet and you pray, but how do we know we're loving God? By how we love others. Jesus said... How can you say you love God whom you've not seen when you despise your brother whom you have seen? 
And he teaches this principle that the way we know we're loving God, that we're building a solid life by we're putting in the extra time to practice what is preached, is by how well we love others. And can I push it just a little further? Others that don't like you. Others that have done some pretty crummy stuff in their life that you don't approve of. Others who don't look like you. Others who don't act like you. Others that you just really don't like. Love them like you say you love God. Amen? Amen? What God wants you to know is He's not mad at you 